It's not just the NSA that's gathered the haystack. We've all gathered the haystack, right? We all have the haystack right here. The planet's haystack is, is available to us and uh, our, quality, our challenge is how to go and create for ourselves a small area of high quality information rather than a sea of noise. Let's start with Live Players. And you have a podcast called Live Players with Eric Torenberg. Mm -hmm. What are Live Players in your framework? How do you think about that? I think that we all imagine ourselves as uh, very agentic individuals, right? We move through the world, we make our decisions, um, you know, we, we, we work where it's economically rational to work, we uh, marry who it makes sense to marry. But statistically speaking, most of us do the same thing. And most of us do the same thing, even when objectively it doesn't make sense, right? Like the default way of doing things sometimes is the best way. There's a lot to be said for uh, Chesterton's fence and uh, you know the concept that even if you don't know a reason for something, if it's been an inherited tradition, maybe that's the right way to do things. So there's certainly a wisdom in following convention. But we also follow it when it doesn't make sense, right? And there have been many events in the last few decades and uh, centuries to demonstrate this, if nothing else than the various bubbles, right? Where if you got into real estate, 2006, 2007, when everyone's getting into real estate, maybe that was a bad time, right? right? Maybe you had a bad time after, um, or perhaps some of the most popular cities to live in the world are actually not that good uh, places to live. Maybe some of the most popular schools are not the best schools and so on and so on. Right. So nearly all of us, whether we want to or not, follow almost cookbook recipes for life, for work, uh, for intellectual creativity, all of this. Right. So Live Player, I would say, is the exception. Uh, I think there are probably a few 10,000 Live Players in the world. Uh, these are people who have demonstrated over and over again that they can go beyond the recipe. They can leave the sort of pre-programmed script of our lives and do something new. One of the best indicators that someone is a live player is the ability to say, in a professional context, jump industries very successfully many times over. Mm -hmm. Say, if you know, you run a successful rocket company and a car company, <laughs> yeah. right? Hmm, right. Uh, who could yeah, that who be? could that be? But you know, I feel in 2011 or 12, uh, people didn't yet recognize that you know Elon was a bit special. Now everyone uses him as an example for everything. So it's a good idea to look around who might other people be who successfully jump such domains. Um, I think that you know decades ago, uh, it's a good Arnold Schwarzenegger would actually be another good example, mm. right? Uh, you have someone who is a bodybuilder who becomes an actor and everyone's like, well, you're not really an actor. You see, you're just like a big muscle mm -hmm. guy. And he goes into politics and like, you're not, you're not really a politician, okay? You're an actor. So in a way, maybe that's, you know, when he became governor of California, uh, he achieved recognition as an actor. So uh, maybe we'll recognize him as having been a good governor uh, once he achieves something different. Um, so these are like some relation to these careers, right? Like, like being a CEO, or there is unfortunately a commonality between acting and politics, mm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been others who have made that jump, but I think the consistency of like peak achievement is something that's, that's uh, very interesting, right? It means that they're not just floundering, right? It means that they're not just um, sort of trying to find their spot in the world. Uh, they're, peaking the, they're picking these goals, they're outperforming people who maybe follow industry standards or best practices or, or professional norms, and they outperform them quite a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We were just talking about Elon Musk and Sam Altman mm -hmm. uh, a minute ago. Um, who else do you see as kind of key current life players mm -hmm. um, today? In the world, yeah. 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 Um, you know, honestly, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to tech, I think, honestly, of course, Sam Altman is a great example. Uh, someone who successfully ran Y Combinator, 
and has pursued artificial intelligence even when it was not the obvious um, you know, universally acknowledged uh, next stage of the tech industry, right? It's good to remember that OpenAI was this very strange nonprofit entity, uh, wild eye talking about, you know, possible transformative impact of AI. Actually, ironically, also the danger of AI, right? OpenAI started as, right. in a way, an organization very focused on AI safety that thought that this could be a disastrous outcome for humanity. Well, regardless, ChatGPT has not ended the world. It's become one of the, you know, one of the fastest growing products ever. Uh, and Sam Altman's not done. He seems to be backing things like fusion startups and also hardware startups, which is a very reasonable way of thinking about it, right? If you go from first principles and you assume, maybe to simplify, all you need is lots of compute, well, eventually, you, you, no matter how good you are at fundraising, and Sam Altman's probably one of the best fundraisers in the world, maybe the best in, in a tech context, right. mm -hmm. uh, you will run out of GPUs to buy. And no matter how much money you give NVIDIA or TSMC, uh, maybe they won't build enough. So maybe you need a radically new way to build GPUs. And then if you're building way more GPUs, well, OK, at the end of the day, maybe you'll actually need way more electricity. Maybe electricity starts to be an important price, uh, an important factor in the final price of any AI-related products. Now, will this work out the way the sort of marketing lays it out? I'm not sure. I'm actually rather skeptical of some details of the so-called scaling hypothesis in AI. But the truth of the matter is that like looking at several industries, investing in them deeply, leading them deep, leading, going deeply there, mm -hmm. following logic and doing these like jumps where it's like, oh, we're gonna go from AI to hardware to energy. Th these are non-obvious jumps. These aren't the kind of things you just do following random trends, right? Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things you do following some sort of thinking, an internal, uh, uh, either a tradition of knowledge that is like relatively special that you're a uh, part of, or just reasoning from first principles, maybe literally physics, right? Other life players in the world um, I think, uh, you know, I think, I think Bezos is not yet done. I think he has demonstrated such a long track record of long-term thinking, of unusual bets, of adaptability, um, that I would be very, very surprised now that he has made Blue Origin, the space company, more of a focus that it doesn't find a very economically productive niche. Now, it's probably not going to build a competitor to Starlink, but Starlink is surely not the only thing to do in low, low Earth orbit and beyond. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about this is that actually he was writing about this uh, sci-fi desire to pursue space habitats in like literally high school. This is like a funny mm -hmm. little part of his biography. Oh, and at least at one point, he was on record saying that, you know, um, I'm just going to try to make so much money that it will be possible to fund a private space program to bring humanity to space, to like, you know, alleviate overpopulation on the Earth and have us live in these orbital habitats. Uh, unlike Elon, he doesn't want to go to Mars. He sort of takes this idea. I think it was von Neumann who first proposed that maybe a planetary surface is not the right place for a technologically advancing civilization. Maybe we should be, you know, deconstructing the asteroids and making like, you know, orbital habitats, like mm -hmm. nice little gardens, yeah. garden jewels in space. Vacation homes. and Yeah, yeah vacation homes on like, you know, spinning uh, O'Neill cylinders where, you know, that simulates the gravity of Earth. Right. We've all seen this, right? In mm -hmm. like sci-fi art yes. in the 70s. Right. That's kind of an abandoned future. and. Um, Often, life players are also people who are committed to this or that ideological vision. It can be like technological, it can be political, it can be religious. And this leads me to, you know, an unfortunate observation, which is that not all life players are great people mm. in the sense they're not all wonderful people or, or good people. Uh, they are just capable of going off script. And often this combined with skill can result in extremely high achievement. They rewrite the book, right? They write the book that the next generation of uh, people in their field, be it politicians, founders, scientists use. So I think in 
the greater world today, um, unfortunately, say Vladimir Putin is a live player. I think he has shown remarkable political adaptability throughout his career. I think while the Ukraine war is not going quite the way he would want, uh, so many other things have gone basically the way he wanted. Do we remember the phrase crushing Western sanctions, right, in the mm -hmm. aftermath of when the war started? Those sanctions have not crushed Russia's economy. In fact, Russia's economy is fine. And all of the Western sanctions where Germans, Japanese, and Americans stopped selling Russia various high-tech products, they just bought them from the Chinese. Right. So trade with China has greatly expanded. The financial system in Russia has not crashed. And the Russian position on the land that they're currently occupying did not implode, right? And then we can add further, further details to this, such as, um, you know, uh, diplomatically, diplomatically, Russia has done a surprisingly good job for being um, as disaligned with the Western world as it has in like sort of shepherding this objectively declining power. So that's an example of a, of a life player one might find objectionable, right? Still in the world today. Uh, we'll see. Uh, people do get old. People do get out of it. But unlike, say, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who has the luxury of retiring from politics without facing, you know, prison or death, I think Putin has stumbled into the key conundrum that every Roman emperor understood. It's impossible to retire in that kind of system, right? A sort of live by the sword, die by the sword observation mm -hmm. where the moment he retires, what's his expected lifespan, right? Many of his opponents in Russia end up, you know, falling out of windows of hospitals. Uh, you know, the uh, head of the Wagner group that attempted that sort of coup protest. It was always super unclear what, yep. uh, you know, what was the story that they, uh, that they sort of like mismanaged grenades yes. when flying on a plane. I'm like, okay, okay. So mercenary <laughs> commander, they were just like playing grenades for fun in the uh, plane and then the plane crashes, right? Almost certainly a political assassination, sure. right? Almost certainly. And uh, he himself, you know, being a KGB guy and having worked with KGB guys knows that he's surrounded by wolves. So. That's like another interesting situation where um, there are live players who retire because for some of them, they just achieve what they wanted to in the world. Yeah. And that's also a, a way, say, a live player can, you know, there's no fundamental change in personal qualities, but they sort of go dormant, right? And then for the purposes of modeling the world like a strategic like game of some kind, you can consider them a dead player then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there players in recent memory who have fallen off or switched from being live players to passive? Mm. Well, you know, I think that there are just many, many remarkable people uh, in the world. If I were to pick one, I would say that Arnold Schwarzenegger is retired, right? right. Uh, he is occasionally issues various statements on some social matters and so on. But there's no like deep political campaign he's pursuing. There's no big company he's pursuing. Right. He's doing this like kind of like honestly very cushy sort of philanthropic former celebrity right. thing. I'm sure right. he occasionally takes small movie roles still, but you know that's not yeah. really a thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so across these different live players, though, they operate often very differently. The you know the commonality mm -hmm. is that they're very agentic and active yes. and going off script. Yes. How do you think about the different flavors and different styles, tenets mm -hmm. of all those? different live players? Well, I think that, like I described, uh, there is definitely a small distinction between people who are pursuing a particular concrete tradition of practice or knowledge that's perhaps very small, very niche, and that they expand and upgrade it versus people who go almost completely from first principles. I think that, say, Elon is a better example of someone going basically from first principles. And then someone like, Mm, the French president Emmanuel Macron, who I would also consider a political live player, perhaps not quite excelling in foreign politics the way some other people do, but very good at navigating electoral politics inside France. Like for a little bit when he was elected, everyone was convinced he was the good guy, right? The, the sort of the neoliberal international economists liked him, the uh, centrists liked him, the populists liked him, and even some of the left liked him. 
And you know, whatever one thinks, that was an interesting and dynamic political agenda. And uh, he's done several other things, such as pivoted France strongly towards pursuing artificial intelligence. Um, you know, EU representatives were quite mystified that French uh, officials and diplomats were pushing against EU regulation of artificial intelligence because that was the directive they received from the president. And that is very interesting, right? When there's a president that has this authority to do his job. So he's not just good at getting elected, he's good at getting the officials in the French state to follow this contrarian, unusual vision. Mm -hmm. And he's done things like sp spoke at various, uh, you know, tech events, secure state funding for French companies. There are even rumors that uh, he participated in phone calls to try to recruit uh, French nationals working for major AI companies here in the Bay Area, get them to, mm. you know, try okay. to convince them to move to Paris. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty compelling. Yeah. You know? That's pretty compelling. That's pretty hands-on. And also it's clearly a belief in exceptional talent because you believe it might be worth a 10 or 15 minute phone call. If you do like 10 of those, well, maybe there's a big AI company in Paris. And then you can sell the story of Paris being the obvious tech or AI right. hub in the European Union. Um, and so on and so on, yeah. right? Uh, people also forget that uh, one of the political allies he had um, was a uh, it was a Fields medalist who made his way to French uh, Parliament. So there's a document called I think uh, uh, France's AI strategy that's you know very much worth reading, uh, written by both uh, you know, by someone who's both a mathematician, uh, the Fields Medal being the equivalent of mathematics mm -hmm. to a Nobel Prize. Uh, and a politician. Um, now, why did I start talking about Emmanuel Macron? I think he's not operating from first principles, actually. What I think he's doing is operating from what I described earlier, tradition of knowledge, right? The sense of uh, a rigorous body of thought, theory, and knowledge that you can apply to new circumstances in the world and respond to them. I think he's responding to a very high quality classical education. Uh, I think he's like philosophically literate and he's also very politically literate. He's not just, you know, passing sort of the exams. I think he, he reasons a little bit like a philosopher, right? Mm. So if you have this perspective on French history as the history of philosophy, right? And we're so good at thinking and, you know, our math uh, institutes are some of the best in the world. Well, where can we use math to make France excel? AI becomes a very natural answer. It's not the socially conventional answer of what was cool in Paris before ChatGPT went viral, right? Because even before that, uh, there was a desire to push France in this direction, but it's very logically entailed by this perspective on a, honestly, probably like a little distorted, but a very a strong self-conception of France as a, as a philosophical civilization, a civilization of reason, a civilization of genius, of universal culture. There's an interesting way in which, uh, you know, France is like America's sister republic, right? The United States is sort of this shining city on the hill since the 18th century believes itself to be a great exemplar. And so did France. Now France's track record, perhaps a bit worse, but the aspirations of the French Revolution were truly universal, right? The first declaration of human rights originates from the rights of man and citizen in the French Revolution. So their view is that, you know, and this is not by now a, a rather right-wing French view, but it is implicitly baked into so many of their institutions that, oh, our, our culture and, and reasoning is just the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And obviously eventually we'll produce the right geniuses that show this to the world. And there'll be political geniuses like Napoleon or, uh, you know, Marie Curie, who of course was Polish by birth, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. France also accepts French. immigrants. Well, she speaks French, therefore she is French, yeah. but her French has to be good. And we're definitely going to bully her until her French is good. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because so, you, can't, you can't think unless you speak French, right? right exactly. you, you think better, right? <laughs> so how do you see the role of a, of a uh, life player or a great man, a great founder in the social imagination of the average person. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically of our time right now where there's a there's sort of a sense, not everywhere, certainly less so in a place like Silicon Valley where there's a lot of agency, but in general I feel like the if you were sort of to poll the 
the American spirit at large. There's a sense of deceleration, bureaucratization, mm -hmm. lack of greatness, mm -hmm. uh, and why somebody like Elon captures the popular imagination. It's not just because he's, you know, made billions or whatever, but it's because he's doing great things. And so people are, young guys in particular, are inspired by figures like Napoleon, like mm -hmm. Augustus Caesar, like Julius Caesar, like, uh, you know, uh, 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 Elon Musk. And so how do you, how does that fit? What does that relationship look like in your mind? I think that um, nuance here has to be, you know, I have to establish some nuance with, um, you know, the, there's a sort of great man uh, theory of history that historians in the 20th century, I think, critiqued and discounted to too great a degree. And one can easily be a live player and not shape the history of civilization very much. But I think one can also be a live player and shape uh, the future of humanity quite profoundly. I have a script, a manuscript uh, called Great Founder Theory. Uh, where I describe what I think is the mechanism through which people can shape entire civilizations. That is when they create new institutions, right? Um, you know, new states, um, new forms of organized religion, um, you know, religious orders, cities. Sometimes they found cities, um, political parties, and so on, so on, uh, companies. So I think that people intuit that the historians are somewhat wrong. Almost everyone intuits that, but by which I don't mean classical historians, I mean the sort of historian academic consensus. Right. They can intuit that if there was not Elon Musk, the uh, ele electric vehicles would be much slower to come onto the market, maybe decade, two decades, three, decade, uh, three decades. If we're talking about 30 years, well, the technological landscape is going to be so different then. And everything related to oil is going to be so different then that really it will be a very different world. And I would also say no one would really be doing space companies were it not for Elon. Like I, I don't even think 50 years from now we'd have a lot of privatized space flight. Uh, we'd have satellite manufacturers, but they'd be plodding along at the same sp slow pace that the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency are going, where they basically don't bring launch costs down at all, right? This was truly like a big leap. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to mass in orbit, quantity has a quality of its own, right? The cheaper it is to bring a lot of mass, the more viable it might in the future be to do something like orbital manufacturing or to, you know, blanket the sky in Starlink satellites providing internet everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's not the kind of thing you can do with the high launch costs that used to be in place. So people intuit that, right? People intuit that. And the future is not as written as many people might find it comforting to believe it is. I think a lot of humanity's future is left to our agency. It's almost a, ch a challenge by nature to find within ourselves the agency for a good and positive future. And then only a very small number of us really finds it in themselves to answer that implicit call, that challenge, right, to shape that future. But we all admire it when we see it. We all aspire to it. And that's why people seek these exemplars and want these exemplars. Um, I do think that it's kind of a negative sign that Elon stands out quite as much as he does in this sort of like industrial, technological, hard tech space, right? Uh, 1900, you would found no shortage of great industrialists pushing forward the frontiers of many technologies. So in a relatively stagnant era, you know, the exceptions that prove the rule become almost um, avatars, the reputation almost exceed even their great contribution because they, uh, they prove it. They, they disprove this idea that we should all just give up as sort of inevitable historical trends and forces are going to push us where they're going to push us. Like there's a way in which um, this sort of Peter Thiel non-determinate optimism and extreme general pessimism, this sort of match in this horseshoe theory way, because both if you believe in doom and inevitable utopia on say something like AI, 
it cashes out to doing nothing. Right. It's the same action. And it's the easiest action you can do. You can just do nothing and go with the flow. And either it's we're all doomed, but that's okay because humans are bad and we're destroying the environment or something like that. Or, well, AI is going to obsolete me in three years. Um, I, I don't really have to think about like the next 30 years or let alone 300 years of humanity if AI is going to figure it all out for us. And, you know, I'll, all I need to do is... Uh, Follow OpenAI's Twitter account to, to see <laughs> when they when the when the white smoke is released from the chimney at the OpenAI building that you know announces that an AGI has been made. <laughs> right. Super intelligence is yeah. here. You know, everyone relax. Infinite exactly. vacation begins today. <laughs> yeah. So you see a swing back towards more live players, potentially as people see Elon and others. We yeah, get more yeah. of like an eighteen hundreds type of scenario where people see the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and and imitate. Yeah. And ho hopefully, like, agency inspires agency in others. Right. It's very positive sum. No one ever sees someone do something remarkable and is then deeply demoralized of like, no, I'm never going to be able to do as much. Right. Uh, th there's this one story of, um, of uh, uh, Caesar weeping at the statue of Alexander the Great. But in a way, that's not even an example of this. It's like a guy who's extremely ambitious, who's dispirited that Alexander achieved way more than he did by 30. It, we obviously all know who Julius Caesar is. So clearly he wasn't crushed deeply. He was just felt a fury to compete with that and right. to imitate it and to exceed it. And uh, he did. Yeah. He at least matched it. What do you think is the cradle of those sort of people? Is that a, uh, you know, born or made? And what what is the environment that you think produces people like Yeah, is there a common moms? thread across, across yeah. these folks? Well, I think that... Um, there's certainly something inborn. There's certainly something that, you know, often they have very different personalities, even in very early childhood. And, you know, how exactly that gets formed, whether it's, you know, genetics, whether it's very early childhood environment, I don't really know. So there is some distinctiveness about them. But honestly, there are millions of people who are distinctive in this way. I think some of it rests on, on chance and the sort of upbringing where the idea that you could do something great is already presented to you as an option, right? You apply yourself to it. Uh, there's massive variation in human history between cultures as to what extent they encourage exceptional achievements and outliers. That in fact, many ways in which all cultures and civilization punish outliers and um, punish even great achievement, be it artistic, scientific, military, economic, and so on, right? And, you know, there's a way in which it is uh, threatening uh, always for incumbent institutions and incumbent political players. Live players themselves are, in a political sense, not always each other's friends. And even in an economic sense, they can be very serious and rough competition. Mm -hmm. I think that to try to engineer like an individual through upbringing to be a live player, that's just too hard. I don't think we understand education enough. Um, I think most of the things that I could point to and recommend are things that are good to have, even if you're not a live player, um, even if you're you know living a, a respectable, productive life. Because let me emphasize, one can be say, you know, a dead player and be a very accomplished surgeon, uh, saving lots of lives, or a very skilled software engineer, uh, you know, producing excellent code that you know makes makes ChatGPT a little cheaper or something like that. Right? Uh, there are many, many productive, high skilled things one can do where one follows like sort of the conventions of their field very closely. It almost requires, in my mind, to have a cohort of that dead players behind a live player to, yeah. to help them execute their vision yeah. so, in yeah. some sense. Yeah. It's it's not it's very difficult for an organization to really house more than one live player. So this is a correct intuition. Uh, so perhaps um, a different way we could think about this is that there's a deep uh, symbiosis between sort of people who competently execute and people who are uh, competent and driven generalists that help everyone orient harmoniously into 
a functional organization, a functional institution, right? And perhaps there's like a, there's a deep mutual need there. Um, now, for you know engineering a specific person to be a live player, as I said, I think too hard, but I think we can certainly shape culture so that we encourage in a very deep way the development of agency. And then almost statistically, almost probabilistically, in society, life players will emerge. And everyone, you know, follows good examples, right? You, you named Elon. In antiquity, we could have said that Alexander the Great was inspiring both Pompey uh, the Great and Julius Caesar. And, you know, of course, they fought, but there was a whole crop of Roman politicians who were like, hey, we, we have the Mediterranean to ourselves practically. We could have a Roman Alexander the Great. And they were all thinking about who's going to be the Roman Alexander the Great. They were all aspiring to that and pursuing it. Uh, so it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. But yeah, I think we, we, we have to do, we have to change schooling to a significant degree. I suspect currently schooling is one of the biggest barriers. What do I mean by this? Um, I think especially there's a lot of evidence, mostly for uh, young men, but to some extent also women, uh, that basically school produces depression and causes you to, you know, punishes rather than rewards agency, uh, certainly punishes any kind of uh, troublemaking in a way that's more so than 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, right? Like. Um, the statistics are pretty damning with regard to the way boys are dropping off in academic performance. That doesn't suggest a problem with the boys. I think it suggests a problem with the schools, right? Yeah. And with with um, with girls, well, some people blame this on social media and so on. But say you know rates of suicide are high, body dysmorphia, all of these very serious developmental problems, which in a way stem from um, an excessive focus on comparing yourself to others on, uh, say, social media. There's like a, a competition mm -hmm. and an imitation. And while imitation can be instructive and it's a very natural way for us to socialize ourselves and learn, um, perhaps a focus on, on independent agency and uniqueness would help fortify even the non-life players among us psychically from these images uh, of success, beauty, whatever, that we, we pursue in a competitive way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like the social media likes, right? Yeah. Like, why, do you not, why are you on the same level as someone that has 50,000 likes on their Instagram post? That's like not an obvious question to answer if you're a teenager. It's not an obvious. There's no, there are few good obvious answers to that. Yeah, it's a curious yeah. thing. It breaks your... It shapes your entire worldview. Yeah. 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 Uh, and when we are recording in the, in the primer office, thanks to Ryan Duff for letting us uh -huh. uh, record here. And part of what they're trying to solve, mm -hmm. we'll release an episode after this one, is, uh, is yeah, creating schools that create the conditions for uh, more agency to be developed in the kids that attend them. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how did you get started thinking about all this? What's your background? And I know you ride the Brismark. Uh, the Bismarck, Bismarck brief. brief. Uh, how do you, how did you get to this uh, this point that you're, you're thinking and writing about all this stuff? Yeah, um, you know, I originally started in a completely different direction. I was, uh, you know, stu studied physics in uh, undergrad, and but very early in my twenties, I reoriented towards wanting to understand why so many of the key institutions of the Western world seem to be in um, in trouble. There seem to be a breakdown in academia and so on. Became very interested in uh, political science, economics. Um, it held a, a variety of basically nonprofit research positions. And at some point, I realized, wait, you know, why? You know, I had moved to the Bay Area at that point. Um, why couldn't I find something in this space that would be valuable to decision makers and valuable enough that I could bootstrap sort of a consulting research firm, which I did. 2017, I founded Bismarck Analysis. Um, I, you know, 
poached a few researchers that I had become friends with, and we went around and we talked to uh, clients, you know, uh, high net worth individuals, philanthropists, and so on. And I showed up and I was like, hey, you want this question answered as to who, who is actually in charge of, I don't know, Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund, or uh, what is actually the state of this industry? Uh, and me and my team would get to work. And I just did that over and over again. And it was at first difficult, but then our reputation built on itself. And for the Bismarck Brief, it actually started as a private letter to current and former clients of my consulting firm. You know, to sort of remind them we exist, to remind them we are very smart. You, know, you, have, to, you have to market yourself, no one yes. else does. And that we have this like uh, unique perspective on, on society and events. And then I was like, wait, we're, we're doing such deep research for this because we have to stay credible to them. Is there a way to democratize this, to, to, to share this widely? And the answer was this uh, paid subscription newsletter, Bismarck Brief. Uh, you know, there are people who subscribe to it for basically investment advice. There are uh, you know, members of the uh, British Parliament who are subscribers. So some people in policy and politics subscribe. Um, but also just people who are curious about what's happening in the world. People who want, might want to read four to 5,000 words, direct analysis on, say, ASML, the Dutch firm, uh, or TSMC, right? The people actually making the NVIDIA chips in Taiwan, mm -hmm. or perhaps are interested in Russia's uh, nuclear industry, or China's big buildup of nuclear reactors, mm -hmm. or maybe are interested in what's happening in West Africa. So a mix of uh, geopolitical, technology, economic news. And that proved to be very popular. It sort of uh, started making the Substack bestseller list. Um, I was at one point persuaded. I think I talked to, I think it was Hamish from one of the founders of Substack that sort of persuaded me to move there. And uh, we've been quite happy with their, with their services so far. Uh, yeah, and over the years, I'd also you know read a lot of uh, history books and so on. And, wrote articles that were published in various journals and magazines uh, on this bigger historical perspective, which is harder, harder to monetize, admittedly. But I think it's two sides of the same coin, right? If you want to understand the present world, you have to have this full data set of human behavior. Where do you get those data points, right? If you think like a physicist, where do you find the data points to pull through the line and say, this is the correct model of humanity and big society? It has to be history, right? Yeah. The present, no matter how big, how complex, it's just one data point on what humanity is or could be or was. There are many other data points in the past, and the future will inevitably be different from the present. So to figure that out, you, you have to cross compare. Um, and I think that also brings me to the implicit question of why didn't I pursue this in academia? And the answer is, I think academia is walled off from practice in society in a very deep way, especially when it comes to politics, economics, and so on. And secondly, I think academia is much more dysfunctional than it was 100 years ago. Uh, it's essentially become a sort of a job, jobs program for curators. So no longer is it a refuge for people who can idealistically deeply dedicate themselves to the pursuit of knowledge. It's become this sort of, um, yeah, you, you stake out a very small piece of field of knowledge, very specialized, and ideally so specialized, no one else is interested in it. Uh, and then you basically write requests for funding that are approved or rejected by committees over and over and over again. And that's your intellectual career for 40 or 50 years. Like yeah. it's obviously like there's some use in that, right? There's some right. use in collecting all these hyper specialized little things, but it's just so hard to do like a generalist or synthesis thing. And it's right. much harder than it was, say, a hundred years ago. And the competition is very, it's very tough, right? This is a way in which I think competition pushes against intellectual creativity, because if you worked ever, you know, the, the, the joy of working with the CEO is that you have one person and you convince them of something or not, and they say yes or no. The curse of working with a committee is that you have to persuade all of them that you agree with them, even when they all disagree with each other, right? <laughs> that makes committees almost inherently a filter against 
novel ideas, right. against intellectual creativity, against generativity. And that's just that's just too much dampening on the intellectual process in academia. You have bureaucratic logic and committee logic telling people who can even attempt mm. certain kinds of research. Right. And then on the other end, you also have peer review, which should be should happen, but is super bureaucratized, uh, filtering out even the stuff that does get produced. So in a way, I think what we should do is radically upregulate generativity and also open up peer review in a way where why not have an academic paper be basically published on some platform, much like a blog post, and critiqued or community notes uh, yes. verified or checked uh, like Twitter does. Why are we using this archaic and weird system owned by Elsevier, by the way, another Dutch company of like these, these closed gated journals. We have to pay so much to access the journals where the scientists doing the review aren't even paid. So often they do a bad job. They just are like patting their resume. Right. It's just a mess. And There's the a public even a recursive when it, aspect to it. Like you know, yeah. journal sites, that it's other study and that study cites this one, and that one studies mm -hmm. this one. And then they all just, maybe not you know, mm -hmm. two links, but 10 links. Uh, in the chain, they have, uh, all cite each other, uh, and sort of the the ridiculous example of this is uh, the plagiarism scandal recently mm -hmm. in Harvard, where it's like it's not even she's not even citing another study; she's just literally copying word for word uh, a study or a paper or whatever, and just saying this is a new thing. Where you go from production of novel ideas and advancing a field mm -hmm. to just the whole job seems to become, uh, curious your thoughts on this, but the whole job seems to become just stasis, preserve the status quo. Uh, no, no innovation, no new thinking. You have to please everyone involved in the decision-making process. How could you possibly innovate? Right. Um, and the point you made also about uh, the spread of plagiarism in academia is a result of an impossible pace of publishing. Um, the ratchet of competition and pretend intellectual productivity, right, where you have a paper published very frequently. You know, in the 19th century, someone uh, could be considered a very productive mathematician if they published once in a decade. But the paper was worth reading, right? No. Right. That is impossible to do. Like the new paper today. is out. You'd want to read it, sit well, down. Well, to it, it is my career. contribution to mathematics, right. this grand cathedral of the mind, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> like you have to treat it with respect. You're going to like work on it for a long time, right? right? Yeah. yeah, today that that's just not possible. So if you're constantly produced, basically we've confused research for homework and we're asking them all to do homework. And much like a 12-year-old, if you give them too much homework to do, they just cheat. <laughs> just copy, and, and 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 like a lot of the very ambitious people, like people who end up running Harvard, let's say, right? Uh, these are people who are already very busy maneuvering themselves into the right position. Where are they going to find time to research? They now have to pretend to be good researchers. Well, so they do, right? And that's why it's a set of such bad incentives that we have to look much more deeply. I, you know, of course, there's a personal failing if one conducts themselves with less than integrity. But the incentives are so bad that no one with integrity almost can make it in certain positions. So yeah. we need to change those incentives. It's a systemic problem. Yeah. What are the tools of good research? You mm -hmm. mentioned like learning all these things that your firm does that are not surface information, not readily mm -hmm. available. How do you all go about doing that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there are many uh, very good private information services already in a variety of domains. This is especially true of investing, but even in technology. So all sorts of relatively pricey, industry-specific uh, information subscription services to begin with. Then there are various techniques, pieces of software you can use to um, pursue open source intelligence. Then finally, it is kind of a, a bootstrapping process where if you work in an industry or if you work in a field of government, inevitably you know things that outside uh, people outside the field don't know, right? It doesn't have to be classified. It could just be obscure. It could just be unwritten. So I think the very best thing you can do is hire a team of diverse experts who have deep industry background from a variety of places. 
why not bring an economist, someone that worked from for the intelligence community, someone that's like a crazy tech autodidact that started a tech company and put them on the same team and then ask them, hey, let's figure out GPU production. What is going to happen both from a national security interest from the United States, China and Taiwan and from a technological side and from a financial side? I would trust that team much more than say just a team of economists or a team of intelligence analysts or a t even even if they still had say top security clearance or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, say people I think overestimate what intelligence communities can do because uh, you know they're like they tackle the problem of finding a needle in the haystack by gathering the world's haystack and storing it on big servers, right? It's sort of like okay, we have every email in the world. Well, 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 great. Well, 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 when's the terrorist attack happening? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. you know, it's very yeah. much this kind of like, uh, it's a deeply unsolved problem. But again, you get people who have deep niche expertise, like who are like T-shaped experts who sort of have a, a, a broad general base and then like a deep specialty somewhere, yeah. including special knowledge. And even when you, you can't disclose something, often you can reconstruct it through other means, through publicly available sources. Mm -hmm. In a way, the search cost is already paid. You know, for example, you worked at a tech company, you achieve some sort of internal result, let's say with AI, since we love using that as an example for everything. You're not going to be able to use the exact same techniques. That would be a violation of your contract, IP theft, etc. But you know it can be done. And for so many things in human history, the biggest question is, can this even be done? And it's very difficult to justify expending resources or your own effort and willpower to do something that is possibly impossible, right? right? So as soon as you know something can be done personally, then you can usually find other ways to do the same thing. And this might be something like, you know, I don't know, demonstrate like uh, the origin of a political decision or uh, create a technology or whatever, right? Many, right. many different ways. So hiring experts from diverse fields, hiring them out, basically gathering these small traditions of knowledge. And then another one would be, um, I do think that a high quality, robust culture of debate and productive disagreement, which is one of the sort of missing things uh, that is not selected for in a super bureaucratized environment. Right, bureaucratic compliance has been conflated for uh, a, a practical intellectual rigor. Mm. Right, there's a reason that when you read letters from a hundred years ago, you know, if they're people for decision makers, they sound so eloquent, and they, you know, address each other's points. That's because the memo used to be just a practical tool of organizational uh, decision making. Right, arguments were presented, rebutted reasoned about, and then some decision maker would ultimately decide when there was enough discussion. That's how big organizations of were run 1900 to 1960 at least. Hmm. And since then, the, the, the contentfulness of the paper, the paper pushers of the world move back and forth, or you know, now digitally, of course, email and Google Docs or whatever, uh, the contentfulness has gone down because we've sort of replaced the target of, oh, produce a report has become a goal in itself, right? So I think one of the most important things internally beside a culture of debate is very carefully evaluating whether a product even needs to be, whether something even needs to be produced. For every Bismarck brief that is published, there is a Bismarck brief that is not published. Many hypotheses are investigated where we pursue them and we decide, actually, this is not important enough to merit our readers and potential clients' attention. Once a week, newsletter goes out into the inbox. That is it. And I manage the organization internally very similarly. Spurious communication, not needed. Tell me what I need uh, to know, and I will read what you send me very carefully. Right? I will read a page much more carefully than uh, 600 Slack messages, let's mm, say, right. right? And, you know, this this can be difficult. I think uh, for people, there's definitely different styles of work and different styles that are valid. But I think for research work, really, you have to be very economical with your words. Um, every sentence, uh, every 
Every page of text should be meaningful. Every paragraph in that page should contribute to the page, every sentence, every word. And uh, once you achieve that, then you're just swimming in the sea of high quality information. And that's really the challenge of our era. It's not just the NSA that's gathered the haystack. We've all gathered the haystack, right? We all have the haystack right here. The planet's haystack is, is available to us. And uh, our, quality, our challenge is how to go and create for ourselves a small area of high quality information rather than a sea of noise. Yeah, that makes sense. I, what do you think of, as you were describing the, the writing, even internally, Amazon basis, you know, it, it, uh, uh, famously uh, pushes for these mm -hmm. memos. Uh, other company that does this um, is uh, in, in some similar styles, Basecamp, 37 Signals, mm -hmm. where they don't communicate via chat, mm -hmm. but they'll, they'll, they'll have to write a long, long form. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a memo, but a, a thesis on a what thesis, you're building, yeah. and somebody has to respond with long form, and they go back and forth. Uh, do you think there is a place for that rapid fire communication, or would you just, uh, for high achieving organizations, would you focus on long form quality content? I honestly think in person work is much better for rapid fire communication. Sure. So there's definitely a place for it. There's a need for it if you're building rapidly or if you're uh, fulfilling a task or project. But you know, I think the phone call remains undefeated for long distance. And you know, we might call the phone call a Zoom call or whatever, but that that's better than many messages. Um, but the Zoom calls are dispiriting compared to in-person meetings. So mm -hmm. just do it in person. If you need to do rapid fire, do it in person. If you need to do long distance, have it be a very paced communication, right? I raised the, the, the metric of how well thought out were letters that people sent, which were a high latency communication. Nothing in our digital era prevents us from treating our digital communication very, um, very seriously with a high barrier to send to each other. People can still text their friends as much as they want, but like in an office environment, you do have the power to just, by fiat, change the culture to be this kind of like more deliberative communication style. And some things might take a little bit longer, and some people might not be able to achieve a high quality of reasoning in that format, but that's okay. They can go somewhere else in the economy, right? There's no need to stick the process to what employees of a dysfunctional organization need. The process should match what the employees of a functional organization need. Right, that makes sense. As you've, do, as you've done uh, research going through this methodology, uh, are there any interesting or surprising pieces of uh, conclusions, let's call them, that you've or your team and you've arrived uh, at that were surprising to you in the first place, but also would be very surprising to mm. how people think the world works. I'm thinking of Peter Thiel's secrets. Yeah. Uh, oh, in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many, but like... Uh, any that, got, any that about. you like. Yeah, any that you like. That um, we're like, people was, assume the world works this way. We did a yeah, deep dive, yeah. and it was actually this other Yeah, thing. yeah. I was surprised by how much global energy demand is relatively stagnant. Like global energy demand is not going up as much as you would think. And I've also been very surprised by basically nuclear reactors and technology where, you know, I thought it kind of made physics sense. I suspected sort of the environmental reasons weren't quite right. I thought it was a matter of overregulation, and to some extent it is. Uh, but I realized, no, actually, you know, okay, building 10 cars makes each car extremely expensive, 10 cars of a single model. Building 10,000, still pretty expensive. Building 10 million, oh, suddenly the unit costs go way down. We would have to be building thousands of nuclear reactors for nuclear reactors to be cheap. And no matter how much you deregulate it, the reality is there would need to be demand for thousands of nuclear reactors, for nuclear reactors to be cheap and also to be safe. You know, the longer, uh, the more data you have on how a model of nuclear reactor performs under different conditions, the safer you can make it. You can incrementally improve the design. So if you build the same design for 60 years, it'll obviously become safer over time, right? Or if instead of one reactor, 
that runs for 60 years. You build 60 that each run for a year. Well, you'll also have more information in parallel, right, of random things that can go wrong. So to make nuclear reactors safe and cheap, we would uh, need to build thousands of them. And you know what? The whole planet does not have enough energy demand for, for, to justify thousands of nuclear reactors. We are still a very energy poor civilization. The world today, we, uh, you know, the most sensible thing for us to do is fossil fuels. The second most sensible thing is solar. Wind doesn't even enter the equation. Nothing else really matters. And nuclear, that's sort of left for a civilization that spent 10 times the energy that we do. So currently, then you might ask, so why do we have nuclear reactors? The answer is a lot of countries need to subsidize a nuclear industry because of defense needs, right? Because of uh, the strategic importance of nuclear weapons. What are, uh, you know, the leaders in nuclear technology around the world? Well, it's Russia, the United States, France, Britain, China, um, Japan, I guess, makes the list. But the Japanese are sort of perpetually prepared to uh, build nuclear weapons if the situation demands it, mm -hmm. right? Including storing a large amount of plutonium for a research reactor that never gets built. Right. But, uh, you know, it's been delayed yeah. many times. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that is that has sort of surprised me. That surprised me. I thought we, I thought we knew what to do. I, I thought we were energy, um, we were energy starved, right? Um, as a society and civilization. But it turns out we've sort of, our ambitions are too small. We, we, we don't think big enough to really harness the abundance of energy that can be found in nature. So we're stuck with doing small scale energy. Like oil is small scale energy. You drill a hole, black stuff comes out, you burn it. Like that, that doesn't need scale to make sense, right? It doesn't need scale mm -hmm. to make sense. Yeah. To what degree, like to play devil's advocate, you know, early on with energy, uh, like coal and oil, you mm -hmm. might have said, hey, there's not that much of a demand for energy in mm -hmm. the world. This horse and buggy world that we live in doesn't need oil and coal. Mm -hmm. um, and yet those industries blew up. Mm -hmm. Like, could we be in a similar situation? And what do you think mm -hmm. the catalyst could be to actually take us to the mm -hmm. place where we would actually need that much energy? You know, I think um, it could certainly kickstart the industry if uh, people who are advocates advocates of of a uh, reducing carbon emissions. We're actually serious about reducing carbon emissions. You could certainly substitute with like maybe some subsidy, a large amount and basically all of our fossil fuels with just nuclear energy. That can get it started, right? And maybe the learning curve, the curve where you like build more of something would drop the cost fast enough that we would find perpetually a new marginal use for nuclear all the way to a very energy rich civilization. I suspect it probably wouldn't be quite enough because otherwise France would have already sort of achieved that, right? They get 70% of their electricity from nuclear. They built as much nuclear as they needed to sustain a French nuclear industry for defense reasons, essentially. And uh, they have very cheap electricity today. Um, but, you know, the new nuclear reactor in France is still pretty expensive. Uh, I could see demand being jump-started by our computers, right? Mm -hmm. So. I am skeptical that we actually need fusion to power all of these computers, all of these GPUs, right? They're quite energy hungry. Uh, but you know, maybe we need normal nuclear reactors, actually. Possibly, eventually, um, AI and computer applications in industry and in our day-to-day -day lives will be so economically valuable and productive uh, that we will, you know, want to spend five or ten times the electricity of the current grid, right? The electricity mm -hmm. production of the current grid right. uh, to sustain them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that could maybe jumpstart us to be a real nuclear civilization. There are other things we could do once you have the much cheaper electricity, because the electricity would also get cheaper as you build more reactors. This is kind of a paradox of industrial society. When it comes to natural resources, you know, the more you want it, and this finite good, the more expensive it gets. But with advanced technological products, the more you want of an advanced technological product, the cheaper it gets, mm -hmm. right? The cheaper unit gets uh, because any sort of profit or benefit is like reinvested into expanding production capacity, right? 
um, and that improves unit economics. And then you ride that little S curve of improvement until you get reach a mature industry. So uh, I could see GPU driven energy demand doing this. I could also see, say, um, you know, maybe at one point we decide global warming is such a problem that you can only really fly planes if you use uh, synthetic jet fuel, right? And it has to be made, let's say, from carbon that you sequester from the atmosphere, another super energy expensive thing. So I could see uh, synthetic fossil fuels, so basically ways to store carbon from the atmosphere and you know put it into usable packages for classic engines to run. Mm -hmm. I could see that driving quite a bit of energy demand, right? Yeah. Well, uh, do you see, you know, if Elon gets us to Mars, uh, also nuclear, that would be a Mars, not on Earth, but mm -hmm. having, you know, um, you, you, I don't know, you may be able, you may drill in some of these planets and not find the same kind of oil that we have here. Yeah. <laughs> so you need to use an alternative power source. Yeah. So nuclear would be a, the right fit there. I think nuclear is very useful for space exploration, no question, and that's been known for, for 80 years, right? Um, you know, even for simple stuff like the um, RTGs, the nuclear batteries that were used to power uh, the Voyager probes, right, that went to the outer solar system and, and beyond, or the more recent, uh, I think, was the, the Cassini probe uh, visited Saturn. And I think New Horizons, if I remember correctly, the probe that uh, you know took those beautiful photos of Pluto. I think that one also had uh, RTGs. Um, you know, Mars, of course, has much less uh, sunshine than Earth, or rather, the energy density of solar is like less. much lower. Yeah. So I think that you know, on Mars, nuclear might very well be the right energy source, especially if Mars has some uranium, which probably it does. Uh, it's kind of funny, though, that there are actually planets that would be rich in what we would think of as fossil fuels. Uh, Saturn's moon Titan has a very dense atmosphere and actually has quite a bit of, a bit of methane on it, so quite a bit of natural gas. Mm -hmm. So carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate energy sources could be found mm -hmm. on some planets, even the ones that we presume don't have life. So that's very interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So mm -hmm. depending on the planet you get to, you might need a nuclear power and civilization or, <laughs> yeah. or just pull it out of yeah. there. Pull, pull out, out of the there. hydrocarbons, yeah, synthesize them uh, from yeah, the yeah. atmosphere or whatever. That's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about France. You also mentioned West Africa earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different topic, but mm -hmm. um, what has been going on in West Africa mm -hmm. and, and how do you see that developing? Well, in West Africa, ironically, we're still talking about France, right? Because France pulled away military support from a few governments. And as a result, a few governments were overthrown uh, in coups. Some of them were actually picked up by Russia's Wagner Group, where they set up uh, deals with the governments to, OK, we'll provide our mercenaries to keep you in power, defeat your rebels. In exchange, you give us exclusive mineral rights, and we profit off of the mining operations. So I think something like four or five of the countries of the Sahel region. Um, so this is the region between the Sahara and you know, the, the more the more tr tropical equatorial areas. Um, this like semi dry environment, right, between desert and savanna. Um, four to five of those relatively large countries now contract with Wagner, and you know, that's a big deal. The Russian mercenary operation has been sort of humbled. Uh, sort of cut down to size, um, made loyal again to Putin. The previous leadership was removed. But that basically weirdly subsidizes the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting situation where France for decades had kind of an, the one of the few cases where the claim of neocolonialism is true was in former French West Africa, where so many of those countries depended on their defense needs on France but also had treaties where basically France's central bank managed their currencies, right? Mm -hmm. And they had right of, you know, they had a, a deal that uh, any sort of new mineral discovery would first be offered to French companies to bid on it before it was open up to competition. So these deals lasted for decades, right? And produced this sort of like unofficial French empire of these now independent states that were perhaps politically and legally independent, but financially 
and militarily dependent on France uh, and sustained kind of a type of stability in the region. So why would that matter? Well, it matters for, it matters for uh, resources of various kinds, including uranium, oil, um, rare earth minerals, and so on. It matters for uh, radicalization, potentially. Like a lot of these countries, you know, ISIS has been basically defeated in the Middle East. Like, so political Islamism has basically been defeated in Iraq, right, and in Syria. Uh, it sort of has maybe a Taliban resurgence in Afghanistan. In Africa, with low state capacity, self-proclaimed Islamic states, like, grab huge chunks of territory. And then that is a security risk globally, because for ideological reasons, these groups never just satisfy themselves with like governing a small area. What they want is to spark the light of a global Islamic revolution and awakening where everyone becomes part of this sort of extremist political entity. Maybe, you know, maybe wages war on the infidels, maybe converts the infidels, something like that. So that is a security risk. And then finally, um, China will in the long run have much more of a vested interest in Africa than Russia will. As I said earlier, you know, no matter how crafty Putin is, at the end of the day, Russia is still a slowly declining power because of various reasons like demographics, uh, just like the difficulty of maintaining its pretty expensive, uh, still Soviet, but now upgraded nuclear arsenal and all of these military capacities, right? It is not that rich a country. Um, it is, a, I think, a, a country with advanced technological capacities, but a relatively poor country, Russia on that, right? So, and that, that's kind of a nuance that people might sometimes alive over. They say, oh, Russia's like, you know, uh, a gas station pretending to be a country. I'm like, look, most gas stations don't know how to uh, build spaceships and nuclear weapons and lasers and drones and yeah. all of that. Russia does, okay? Right. Yeah, it's just, its military is proportionally very expensive for it, right? Even to get these bare minimum viable capacities to uh, invade, uh, say, Ukraine, or to intervene in the Middle East, as they did in the Syrian war with their air force. Um, the other aspect of it is that this part of the world is going to be among the most populous parts of the world in 50 or 60 years. Any political defaults that become dominant in West Africa, Central Africa, and East Africa are just going to be how two billion humans live their lives. Sub-Saharan Africa is probably the only region of the planet that a hundred years from now will have more people living there than today. People still speak of a population explosion since the 1970s actually, but most of the planet has moved to below replacement fertility. It's not just Germany and Japan. It is the United States, it is Canada, it is Russia, it is China, which many people do talk about. But whenever people say, oh, is the one child policy China is destined to have a demographic implosion, I point out, well, if that's true of China, it's also true of US allies such, such as South Korea that have a total fertility rate of 0 0.7 children per wow. one, which is a crazy low rate, right? The very low rates of East Asia have actually continued to go down. Japan now with, I think, 1.3 uh, children per woman is actually relatively high fertility compared to Taiwan and Singapore and South Korea and China. And the United States now has below replacement fertility, right? For a while in the 2000s, the US had higher fertility than say uh, Europe, let alone Asia. And then you look at places like uh, Southern Europe and Eastern Europe and you see the numbers just keep getting worse year after year. I mentioned earlier, uh, restate, that this is not just a matter of countries becoming rich and then having fewer babies. There are countries that are not very rich whose fertility is going down. Uh, India now has a TFR of 2.0. You need 2.1 to renew your population. India's GDP is per capita is much, much lower than the United States, much, much lower than China, right? Uh, it is poorer than Turkey or Mexico. So it's objectively still a poor country, the one that is developing. And its fertility, I expect, will continue to go down. There are many provinces of India, provinces that have hundreds of millions of people living in them. So really, we could think of them as countries, right, if they had been independent, where the total fertility rate is 1.5 children per woman. So these, this is not New York. This is not San Francisco. This isn't even Texas or or France or Sweden, 
This is like actually pretty poor parts of the world. And I think it's kind of scary because I don't think anyone really knows why this is happening, right? About half of the Middle East is below replacement. So it's not just, you know, a case of, oh, you know, uh, the Islamic world, let's say there's a stereotype, the Islamic world. There's some countries that oppress women, therefore their fertility will be high forever. In Iran, uh, you know, not a very, you know, enlightened country in that sense, uh, for t the TFR rate is 1.7, mm -hmm. still below replacement. Now, there's still high fertility Middle Eastern countries, notably uh, Afghanistan, I I Iraq, Yemen, uh, but in most places, the trend is clear. Decade after decade, the fertility goes down. And the only part of the world that still has very high fertility that has not slowed down is Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are in fact living on a graying planet. And this will have many unforeseen consequences. One of them, populations that are older are less interested in technological innovation, number one. Number two, populations, um, the cost of labor will start rising all around the world, right? Currently, we don't really experience a labor shortage in the United States, basically because of immigration, both legal and otherwise, right? That keeps the cost of labor for various things fairly low, uh, even if there are many well-compensated positions. Uh, Japan is experiencing the kind of labor shortages where you have to close down factories uh, because you, you just can't have enough people work there at the wages that would make those factories profitable, right? So that's the second consequence. The third consequence is global energy demand might plateau. So that's why, you know, I find it more plausible. It'll be GPUs rather than human consumption that drives us to a much energy richer civilization. Um, and I think there'll be something really, I, th I think it, I think it is the, one of the biggest questions no one is trying to answer. It's like, why has humanity on the bulk? decided to stop having babies. You would think this would be a more fundamental question. It's like, you know, if I had to diagnose our species, maybe we're suffering from depression. Maybe we're literally collectively sort of, sort of lost the will to live and uh, yeah. we need to uh, introspect and, you know, screw our heads on, right? And get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, on that note, we need to wrap up here, but uh, Samo, where's the best place for people to find you? Uh, yeah, I can be uh, followed on x.com, formerly known as Twitter, at Samo Buria. Um, I tweet links to my writing and uh, I warmly recommend subscribing to the Bismarck Brief. So brief.bismarckanalysis.com. Uh, we send out free newsletters. So even for those who cannot afford our uh, full product, you will occasionally get uh, a publicly available uh, Bismarck report and you can read those. And if you email in as a response to those, uh, I actually read every single response, often because they're very informative and often because, well, I need to see what kind of feedback uh, to give to the team and to my own writings. And so, so much of it is my own writing. Excellent. Excellent. Sam, well, thanks yeah. for coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the show. Thanks for listening to this episode of the New Founding Podcast. New Founding has become a rallying point for founders and investors who are taking serious bets in the face of a stagnant business culture. Our venture fund backs founders building dynamic companies powered by American ideals and a positive national vision. These are the kinds of founders that embody the optimism and competence of the people who come on this podcast. If you're interested in investing in our fund, check out newfounding.com slash venture fund and follow the link to apply.